Okay, hopefully uh, most have joined and we can get started. Um, hi everyone. I'd like to welcome you all to our Google Analytics 4 webinar. My name is Brian Cusick and I lead Scanmar QED's North American team, including both marketing mix modeling and digital attribution. You know, GA4 is still relatively new to the market and we've been getting a fair amount of questions about the data and results that it outputs. That's why we thought it might be useful to host this webinar and explain how GA4 works, especially with respect to attribution, which is an area with which we are quite familiar. Our attribution service called Revenu has always leveraged data from each iteration of Google Analytics. I'm happy to welcome here today with me, Pavel Shima, our attribution lead and somebody who has been using GA data since 2015. Pavel will be leading the presentation today, and I hope that you all find him as insightful and educational as I do. I'm equally happy to welcome Petra Terlach, who is a marketing director at the Nordic e-tailer Cool Stuff. Petra has been our client for four years now, and she's here to provide a client's perspective on GA4 versus other approaches to attribution. All right, so if we move forward to the agenda for today, uh, we're going to start with a quick recap of how how we think of the attribution problem um, and an explanation of what changed in GA4, followed by a case study to explain this in a real-world setting, and then, of course, some time for Q&A. Please feel free to ask questions using the chat in the webinar app, and we will try to answer as many as possible at the very end of our session today. And uh, hopefully everyone's names will show up correctly, unlike Pavel's. Um, with that, Pavel, the floor is yours. Thanks, Brian. So thanks for the intro. And uh, also, you know, uh, welcome everybody here on the webinar today. And this webinar, you know, it's not it's about GA4, uh, which is a hot topic, obviously. Uh, but I just want to point out, we're not going to focus on uh, things like how is you know the new GA uh, based on these events now different than the previous GA? Uh, also, we're not going to talk about how um, long or short period of time uh, you guys actually had to migrate to GA4, uh, or how confusing the beta was. Uh, none of that. Uh, you know, we will focus today primarily on how GA4 works with attribution and whether it's good for you to use it or not good to use it. And if you're using it, just for you to be aware of some of the settings and shortcomings that uh, GA4 uh, inherently has. Um, so, you know, speaking about attribution, um, unfortunately with, you know, the attribution problem uh, has always been about how do we distribute credit fairly to every single player on the soccer field in, in the soccer analogy? And then in the digital advertising world, how much credit we should give to every touch point that was uh, in the customer journeys. Unfortunately, uh, though, with GA4, um, it's a little bit like, for example, if player number two would be a Facebook impression but GA4 completely doesn't see that, and that player isn't invisible to it. Uh, and then maybe player number four is an organic click, and GA4 tends to give a whole lot of credit to it uh, than it should be. Uh, so that's a little bit of the challenges that we have with GA4, and we will dive into the details of why that is and maybe how we can go around that. But first, let me maybe recap a little bit, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure most of you who are attending this webinar are familiar with all these concepts, but just to be on the same page, let's recap what are the different approaches and different attribution models. Uh, so let's say we have a typical or an example of a customer journey that consists of a bunch of impressions and a bunch of clicks and a conversion at the end of the day. Now, the most predominant and wildly used a uh, model is obviously last click, and that gives 100% of the credit for the conversion to the last click, which in this case is a Google Ads click. 
So you can think of it as if there was a conversion worth $100. And in, the, in this case, last week model would assign those, all of those $100 to this GX click, and it would completely ignore all of the clicks that happened before, and those would get assigned zero credit or zero dollars. Obviously, you can use a different position-based model like first click that gives all of the dollars and credits to the first click and ignores all that follow. Sometimes uh, some, uh, some companies and some advertisers would be using linear attribution where uh, you just assign the same amount of credit to all of the clicks that were in the path. And then finally, a model uh, that has for a long time has been present in Google Analytics is time decay. And that model tries to give more credit to the touch points that are more towards the end of the customer journey. Uh, maybe you have noticed that none of these models is actually giving any credit to these impressions at the beginning, which is the first sort of shortcoming of this approach. And then the second biggest shortcoming is that somebody has to actually uh, sort of arbitrarily decide which position is more important than the other. And, you know, that's not a very scientific method to go about it. So I think that's why actually data-driven models were invented and brought to the market. And what is happening with data-driven models is that you are actually trying to assign a really fair and representative credit that every single touch point should deserve. Right, regardless of uh, its position, or regardless what what any human thinks about that, uh, and there are data driven attribution models that are based on clicks, but also the more advanced ones can take into account also those impressions finally, and that way also give a fair credit to more let's say top of the funnel uh, um, campaigns or clicks and, and impressions. Now, in terms of methodology, the data different met methodologies have been developing over the course of the years. So I would say some in those years between 2015 and 2020, the predominant models were based on regression uh, methodology. And there were two really sort of famous and favorite models uh, that were widely used. Uh, that were uh, the one uh, called Shapley value that was based on game theory and then the one uh, based on Markov chains. I would say that from around 2020 though, uh, the industry has shifted to really uh, having been using AI models and, and most of the cases it's much, some, some sort of machine learning approach uh, and, and even more specifically uh, recurrent neural nets. And that is, by the way, what GA4 is using in, in the current iteration. And also, for instance, what our revenue AI attribution is also using. So it's, it's a similar approach and it's being used more and more these days. Now let's maybe dive into how actually the GA4 model works. What is the logic behind it? So the model actually looks at the full customer journey. So in this case, we are seeing some paid search click, social click, affiliate click, and, and then a, probably an organic search click. And it looks about what is the probability that this whole journey is going to convert. And in this example, it's 3%. And then the model does sort of a contrafactual analysis or the algorithm uh, does it, where it says, what would have happened at the uh, search uh, last interaction not being in the data set or, or not being in the customer journey. And it would see that in that case, the conversion probability would only be 2%. And then it can easily see uh, that the, the uplift that this last search uh, click is causing is, is going from 2% to 3%. So it's 50% uh, probability uh, conversion uplift. So that, that's the basic principle how it works. Uh, the model takes into account uh, several things. So it's not just the source of the visit, but also uh, time from conversion, the device type, number of ad interactions, the order also of, of, of these interactions, and the type of creative uh, assets. What does the model, however, not take into account, and, and that's, uh, that's a pity uh, from our point of view, 
is that it does not look on on-site behavior and what is sort of the quality of the visit once the person comes to the website. And, you know, Pavel, I remember this came up recently with the client where, uh, you know, they were pointing out that fine, they can, they can see that a user came from Facebook to the website, but that there was a big difference between, you know, showing up and spending two seconds and leaving versus spending 20, 30 minutes on the site and getting very close to a conversion. Um, you know, could you explain a bit more about why this is important to attribution modeling? Yeah, uh, thanks for your question. I think it's really actually, it comes down to what you said. It's, there's a big difference between, you know, somebody came from a particular Facebook campaign, let's say, uh, but, you know, dropped off and bounced after two seconds and somebody who, you know, came from the same uh, Facebook campaign. So it's basically the same source of the visit, uh, but, you know, maybe spend, as you said, half an hour on the website, um, saw a bunch of pages, read a bunch of articles, maybe even put something into the shopping basket, uh, and, and, but not um, converted yet. But I think such a session, such a visit has put a, such a user much more towards the final conversion than the one when he bounces off after two seconds. And so when we take into account also the on-site behavior, we can try to differentiate between the low quality session and the high quality session. And the model just has more parameters to learn from. So it becomes more accurate and, uh, and more robust as well. So it, it, it is a, a bit of a pity that GA4 doesn't work with that. Um, so, but we also want to be fair in this webinar uh, and, and we want to also acknowledge that there are some things in the new GA that are actually a pretty good ideas or pretty good concepts that are really helpful uh, to the users. And one of those things is Google Signals. And Google Signals try to fill in the blanks in the world where we're living today, where there's a lot of challenges to measurement and tracking, uh, like content banners, like uh, browsers sort of deleting cookies, multi-device journeys, and since, you know, I is 14.5, also certain limitations on how we can track actually conversions. So Google being Google and having a massive uh, user base, they can actually, uh, you know, leverage that and they can, they can leverage the fact that you as a user, you're logged in to a lot of different Google services like Gmail and YouTube and others. And they can use that not only to connect you across devices, connect you across different cookies, but also they can use this observed behavior and then extrapolate on the behavior uh, that is unobserved and non-tracked because of, for instance, somebody did not give their consent to, to being tracked. And, and this, this sketch here, or this schema, is actually coming from the Google Help page, uh, explaining this concept of signals and modeling the unobserved, uh, unobserved conversions. So if I could walk you through it, in this particular example, uh, there's supposed 1,000 ad clicks, but you know 500 of these users click to allow uh, to being tracked, and 500 of them don't give that permission. And in those that give the permission, 50 of them convert. Uh, so, and then, you know, out of those uh, 500 who does not uh, uh, give their permission, Google is actually saying that based on, you know, the millions of different uh, data uh, sets that they have, uh, millions of different companies that they can track, they actually learned that people who don't give the concept consent behave radically different than those who do. And they're saying that the, the people who allow themselves to be tracked have actually three to five times higher uh, conversion rates. Uh, they're three to five times uh, more likely to convert. So in this example, out of these 550 convert, but out of those 500 uh, that didn't give consent, only 12 con converts. And what Google does then, is, and they're saying they're doing it conservatively, so they don't want to overshoot the total numbers of converted users. 
uh, they would just model nine conversions uh, of these unconsented users and add it to the 50 that were observed. And they would end up with 59 conversions total, which is still less than 62 actual that happened, but it's a lot closer to the truth than the 50 that were observed, right? And so they can go from a measurable 5% conversion rate to 5.9%, which is 18% conversion uplift in this case. And that, that is quite significant. And it's actually a pretty nice feature. However, as with everything, almost everything in GA, there are problems with these signals. And the biggest problems with this is that you cannot actually export these signals to BigQuery, which is what most analysts are using these days to work with GA data. And also it's not accessible via API. Uh, so you cannot export it, but you can also not download it via the API. And, and that is a big problem because then you have big discrepancies between the front end uh, of GA and the UI and the application, because in the application, you're going to see those 59 conversions, including the nine that were modeled. But if you download the raw data into BigQuery, you're only going to see those 50 conversions that were observable. And so that creates a lot of confusion uh, and it is very hard or even impossible to reconcile then these two, two, two data points, right? Uh, and so we see that as a big, big problem with the signals that confuses everybody. And just to be, you know, super duper clear uh, so that, you know, I don't get the question in a comment then at the end that, that we were not saying the truth. Yes, the signals, themselves, they actually can be exported uh, into BigQuery and worked with. And for certain use cases, analytical use cases, it's completely fine. But for uh, attribution intents and purposes, it's quite useless because you cannot export along with it a couple of very important dimensions, like for instance, source and medium. So yes, the signals are there, but for attribution modeling purposes, it's not usable and it's going to give you those conflicting results. I was talking about. Now, so we've already uh, seen a couple problems with the new GA4, and let's maybe review uh, some other changes that happened, uh, you know, when migrating from the previous generation of Universal Analytics to GA4. Uh, in Universal Analytics, there were lots of these models that we were just talking about a couple of slides back. And you could so then use and also compare between last click, first click, linear, data-driven, and some of the other models. But in GA4, Google recently announced they're going to deprecate everything except for two models. So you're just going to be left with the data-driven model and then the last click non-direct model, which is a subspecies of a, a, a last click model. So that is that is quite unfortunate, I would say. What is maybe even more disturbing is how is Google treating direct? And, you know, let me be clear that I think Google was already pulling, uh, I would say, some shenanigans with direct already in the universal analytics because there was a setting called campaign timeout that most people had no idea that existed. And by default, it was set for six months. And in that six months, sort of window or period, whenever there was a paid a click uh, and, and that was followed by any number of direct visits, uh, all of those direct visits in that six months window would just get overwritten and would appear and be labeled like uh, paid visits. Uh, so that was really not nice uh, from Google to do this, but at least it could have been changed. The settings could have been changed the window could have been shortened to two hours except instead of six months. So at least that. Now in GA4, this direct is also suppressed by default. And on the following slide, I'm going to show you how exactly. But what's even worse, it cannot be changed. This behavior is just by default, it cannot be changed. So I think that that is even worse than what was happening in, in the universal analytics. And then in universal analytics, you know, raw data Certify API were affected by this campaign timeout, but it could have been changed off uh, or changed, as, as we said. 
Um, but you know, as we established in GA4, the raw data, you know, served by PR and BigQuery, uh, they deviate from the data and in the user, user interface, which is very unfortunate. Uh, so coming back into more of a detail of how is then GA4 treating direct visits. Uh, again, some example of a customer journey where there is a Facebook, Facebook touch point, a direct visit, and a GADS touch point. Uh, and whatever model you use, whether that's the data-driven model or the not last non-direct click model, in both of those cases, direct is just getting zero credit by default. And the only time uh, direct is getting any credit is when the full journey consists of only direct visits, obviously, yeah. Uh, so, you know, however much I can see, you know, that, that in some use cases, and we see that our clients are actually sometimes asking for this, it is actually good to suppress direct because, you know, sometimes the thinking is we cannot really influence direct by changing budgets in our paid media. And so some performance marketers, you know, are actually asking to suppress direct. Uh, you know, we think it would be, much uh, better or, 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 or much, uh, yeah, much better if that would be a setting you can turn on or off and that would be a deliberate decision uh, as opposed to having that as the default and not even, you know, sort of telling people about it. And then we're getting actually into my, <laughs> or ours, I would say also our data analyst in the company favorite issue uh, within GA4, and that is thresholding and cardinality. So maybe when you were browsing some of your reports, you saw this pop-up uh, that says thresholding applied, uh, and and it, it gives a, a brief description of what that means. Uh, and and you know, trust me, it does not mean anything nice, and it has to do with um, something that was already present in Universal Analytics uh, that was called sampling. Uh, it was a little different, but, but quite similar. So sampling uh, happened in Universal Analytics whenever you had too many data to put into one report. And because Google didn't want to you know, do a lot of expensive processing, uh, they would sample. So they would maybe show your results based, of, based on 50% of the data or 5% or 2%, depending on how much data you had. And that could lead to not very accurate results. Uh, to put it lightly. Now, in GA4, it's no longer sampling, but it's thresholding. And what thresholding means that, for instance, if you have a dimension that, that can have, I don't know, 2,000 values, like let's say 2,000 different landing pages, uh, what GA4 can do is just like look at the 100 top that give you maybe 80% of the traffic, and then the remaining 1,900, they would just not show at all. So any of those sort of Landing pages, if we just get a few heads, few sessions, they would just completely not show it in the report. And I have an example here for you uh, where we try to replicate this or, or try to come up with, with a an example that makes sense. So in this example, we're looking at a data set over a certain period of time. And in this particular example, uh, it, it returns to us 34,206 total sessions across this uh, data set when we apply just one dimension called date. Now, if we apply two dimensions, so we add to date, we also add source and medium dimension, all of a sudden, we only see a total of 33,000.5 K sessions. Uh, so already some data starts to disappear. Now, if we apply five dimensions, uh, the count goes down to 29.5K. So we are already missing 15% of the data due to thresholding just because we applied more dimensions. And, and you know, our data guys, they're actually uh, digged up one funny thing also for you guys that you can try at home if you'd like. And that's when you include dimension page location, we will only be left with 257 uh, sessions in this example. In other words, 99, more than 99% of the data is actually going to disappear. I think that that's a big, uh, that's a big issue with thresholding here. 
there's a couple of other things to keep in mind and maybe just to cover them briefly. Uh, you should be aware that the data retention is capped at 40 months in GA4. So making maybe year over year, season over season comparisons is now very challenging, if not impossible. The attribution models cannot really be customized uh, and that is making them a little bit of a um, sort of out of the box or we might even say black box sort of solution. The look back window is capped at 90 days. And finally, the API does not return user level data. And that makes some of the sort of more advanced um, analytical use cases also impossible or very challenging to say the least. Yeah, but as I said, you know, this webinar is about being fair and also to, to recognize that there are some benefits to using GA4. And, and so we would like to sort of spell them out here. The first, obviously, is that it is completely free. But maybe even more importantly, I mean, free if you don't count a small fee that you're going to pay for a uh, big query. But, but that's, that's not really a huge fee in most of the cases. So for all intents and purposes, it's, it's basically free. But maybe even more importantly is that this has been an, an etalon and, 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 and predominantly used web analytics platform for the past decade. So that means that you know a lot of the marketers and analysts they're just used to working with that. They're familiar with the concept, the methodology, the user interface, the reports, etc. That's a huge advantage, obviously. Uh, now it also allows for uh, big query exports, and everything is integrated really well. It's really easy to set up uh, your big query exports of raw data. You can work with them or pass them to your data lake. Uh, so that's also very nicely done. And the signals, you know. Having not done before uh, the discrepancies between UI and, and, and uh, BigQuery is also a nice attempt how to deal with missing data and cross-device uh, issues and unobserved user behaviors and journeys. So all of these are actually pros of, of the new um, platform. Uh, but there are obviously also some cons, and that is that there are only going to be two models, as, as we were saying. There are these big differences between the front end and the API and the BigQuery. And uh, the data driven models don't work with the on site behavior, as, as we were also discussing uh, with Brian. So, those are all not all the cons because you know, we see one more, and maybe in our eyes, sort of biggest downside or shortcoming of the whole GA4 measurement setup. And that is, like Google, in this case, is completely blind to upper funnel marketing activities that are happening on wall card and platforms. And what that means is that it cannot incorporate impressions from wall card and platforms into its journeys and ultimately into the models, which causes a number of issues. So first of all, uh, the uh, significance and impact of lower funnel channels is significantly overplayed, as you will see later in the, in the case studies. The ROI of the vault card and campaigns cannot be properly assessed. And upper funnel display and video activities then uh, still cannot be tied to business performance and cannot be directly compared with the lower channels, which results in a lot of marketers actually still not believing Google uh, that is providing them the good and accurate picture of what's going on. They feel like Google is still giving preferential treatment to their own channels like organic, uh, search, YouTube, etc. So, so that that is an issue. Well, Pavel, I guess there's an easy solve for that one. What just is that? just spend all of your money on Google. <laughs> and you don't, you don't right. have to worry about any of that. <laughs> Yeah, so there you go. Uh, good recommendation from Brian. Uh, yeah, so I mean, if, if you're that kind of company who just spends everything on Google, actually, this might work for you. Uh, but then if you really, really want to get an accurate picture, I think you should strive to get some better measurement and some better attribution. And there actually is a way, which comes to the following slide now. Uh, we believe that with a few but a very important and fundamental changes in the methodology, this could be overcome and is actually overcome by certain players on the market. So first of all, and first of these is 
you have to integrate more data than just the GA data, right? You have to integrate with the data from the platforms themselves, like, like Meta, like TikTok, like Snapchat, and all of these others. The second is something we've already talked about, uh, includes the on-site behavior. That makes the model also a lot more precise. Uh, being quite transparent and also letting users customize the models and maybe run more different data from models in parallel. That is also quite helpful, including impressions into the whole uh, thing and also solving the cross device problem. So, you know, once you sort of deal with these five fundamental issues uh, in a reasonable way, you will be able to get much better results. And because, you know, in Roy Venue, um, we've been sort of innovating on this for eight years now as a company, we have incorporated these and we're coming with, I would say, much better results than the GA4 is. And so, you know, what we've done and what I also believe that for every webinar, it's actually the highlight of the, of the whole webinar is to look at the case studies, right? So what we've done is that we collect we have two different case studies for you uh, now. And uh, we have collected data from our clients and we have tried to look at how do the different attribution models stack against each other and how are they different? So in this example, we looked at data from six different retailers and we are comparing uh, sort of results, which in this case was the number of conversions uh, that is showing in last click pick query that is showing in the data-driven attribution GA4 model, and then compare that with our revenue AI attribution. The first striking difference you're going to see is that for organic, referral, and affiliate, all of those are significantly overplayed by the data-driven model. And as you can see, uh, they get 50, 50 to 150% more conversions assigned, then last click is assigning them. And on the other hand, if you look at the World Gardens platforms, the Google data model is completely unable to deal with that because if you look closely at this category here in the middle, the data-driven model, which is the second column, gives less credit the World Gardens than the last click model, which to me is completely crazy and actually is about 150% uh, away from the reality of things and, and the real contribution that these platforms are making to sales and conversions and to the bottom line. So that is, uh, that is sort of these two big takeaways from this. And then you know, in this case study, we were looking at uh, the channels together. We also thought it might be useful to zoom in on a specific uh, platform uh, within the World Gardens family. And so we did a second case study where we looked on the results of Meta specifically as being the largest representative of those World Gardens. And in this one, we included even more websites. Uh, um, so we looked at 35 websites across 12 different markets. And again, we tried to sort of compare the performance of the models. And in this case, uh, we looked at revenue and we indexed it. So the 100% we next it to the last click in GA4 app. So the 100% represents the last click GA4. So the first thing you're going to notice again, which again is, is very crazy, is that the data driven model gives less credit than last click to Facebook, which, which really does not give to it uh, much justice. Um, and then the real performance on average across these 35 clients is actually 172% more than what Facebook, sorry, what Google claims or is able to calculate given you know, their shortcomings on, on the incoming data. And that is a significant, significant difference. And we're not talking five, 10% difference here. We're talking, you know, 170 point, uh, 72 points, uh, percentage points. So that, that, is, that is really, really big difference. And then, you know, also just for context, just so that you see the full picture, 
We also, in this case study, included what does the platform itself reports as results. So in this case, what does Facebook Business Manager tell us about that, the performance of, of, of themselves? And you can see here that actually Facebook overplays its own contribution 2.5x on average compared to, to the true um, to the true um, significance that it has uh, on on the revenue. Yeah, I mean, this is another another one that came up recently with with a client. I mean, despite being a quite experienced, um, you know, digital media team, they were really surprised by just the the extent to which Facebook was claiming probably too much credit. Um, you know, could you, could you explain a little bit about, you know, why you think that happens? Like, why is it that they claim so much more? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a very good question. And it, it just comes down to a simple fact that, you know, Facebook only sees, uh, the data in isolation. So Facebook knows that they served impressions to these users and these users later converted. And so, um, whether there were some other channels or some other touch points included or not, Facebook is just going to claim 100% of the credit for all of these conversions. But, you know, you have to bear in mind that it's typically not just Facebook, you know, these people saw ads also on TikTok. They also, you know, did some paid search and they did click on paid search or maybe organic search, uh, maybe some affiliates. So there's more channels in the mix, but Clay, Facebook would just say, and you know, they don't have any other alternative because they don't see the other data, that you know, they uh, that they should take all of the revenue or all of the credit from themselves. And that's why, you know, it's such an overstatement, it's such an overshoot in this example. And you know, this is an average of 35 clients. So, you know, I think this this is a pretty, pretty reliable view on how how much they actually overplay that. All right, so I said uh, that maybe the highlight of every webinar are the case studies, but I think maybe there is even better highlight, and that is when uh, we can not only present the data of the clients, we can have clients themselves actually speaking about their situations and their struggles and then how they're trying to solve them. Uh, so I'm more than happy to also welcome here on stage or, or in the webinar with us uh, Petra Terlak uh, from our long long-term client cool stuff uh, and cool stuff obviously is a a e-tailer uh, mainly on the nordic markets uh, uh but a very successful one and so petra welcome here i see you were able to connect so that's great and uh let me ask you just a couple questions to, to shed some light on on maybe how you're working with this or how you're using this so sure. you know we can see here down in the description that you spend me give or take 15 to 20% of your total digital budget on Facebook campaigns and actually close to like 60% uh, if we combine all of the World Garden platforms. So I'm assuming being able to measure the impact is quite useful to you. So could you tell us maybe a little bit more about your experience with the impression attribution from World Gardens? Um, yes, sure. Hello. <laughs> you can hear me, right? Yes. Yeah. Super. Um, yeah, um, it's like you say, it's uh, very important for us since we spend uh, a lot of our marketing budget uh, here. Uh, and if we uh, wouldn't, uh, well, I mean, we haven't used revenue for, I think, four years now we, we've used revenue. And before we basically, yeah, we used um, UA and we used uh, Facebook's own tool, for example. Uh, but since we started uh, using revenue, we've also adapted to using it. Uh, um, and if we were looking at uh, GA numbers, uh, it would be a very expen expensive channel for us. Uh, uh, in the discussions we would have, we would probably uh, say, let's not bother uh, putting time and uh, money and effort on this channel anymore. Uh, and then... You're okay. talking about Facebook, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
talking about Facebook, yes. And uh, but then uh, looking at the numbers uh, in Facebook's own tool, it would be like uh, yeah, like a joke. Like you say, it's like two point five uh, times uh, the re the reality. And we so we can't do that because that would just be yeah, we can't have the good discussions around it because we always say that yeah yeah, but we can't look at these numbers. Uh, so it doesn't really mean anything. What we can do with the numbers in, in the Facebook tool, uh, we can, of course, see is it going better or worse uh, and adjust according to that. Uh, but then we look at in revenue, and I think that's as close to the truth as we can get. And now also since the impressions uh, also added, uh it's even better uh, uh i think it's been like early 2023 with the impressions um yeah and so we released it earlier in this year and so i think you 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 were able to use it for a couple months now so maybe yes. maybe you can also shed some light on on how did that change your workflow or or your mm -hmm. your planning and budgeting process yes uh, so basically, we look at all our channels, both paid and organic, but uh, mostly, of course, paid uh, uh, from ROI venue numbers. And before uh, before the impressions uh, were added, we always said that, yes, but remember, when we look at the Facebook numbers, you need to keep in mind that they are a bit better than what you see here. Uh, so it was always like, just you just need to think about that, but also, what does that mean? Uh, but now when we can also uh, see uh, see the impressions added, uh, we it's, it's still, uh, you know, sometimes, but uh, do we need to think about? No, we don't need to think about that anymore. What we see in Roy Venue is now a fair number to compare uh, to other uh, channels in our performance marketing. Yeah, so I'm, I'm really happy to hear that you were able to get rid of the double thinking because yeah. that, that's been always our goal so that you don't have to think like, okay, this channel shows a certain ROAS, but yeah, we should maybe multiply it in our heads by 1.5 or whatever mm -hmm. to get to the real number. Now we can see the real number. You don't have to do this mental exercise anymore. So I'm really, really glad you're saying that. And maybe a last question, a quick one for you. So um have you seen any tangible changes um, in terms of maybe budget or revenue that uh that that came after you were you started using this impression based distribution um i i think uh, it helps us uh, focus better in, in the discussions we have when i have uh, um, monthly or weekly follow-ups or discussions with the ad manager that actually does the performance uh, we now know that we should not focus on the Facebook ROAS. We focus on the ROAS we get out of the ROI venue number. Uh, so thanks to that, there is a, a little bit of shift in focus. And we look at Facebook a bit differently than from before. And um, yeah, with, with, with all that uh, more focus on the channel and then of course, also other external factors such as uh, where where is the world at right now in a financial state and and hard work and our assortment, of course. Uh, but uh, right now in September, um, we, we see that we cut our spend uh, with 30 uh, percent and uh, still increase the uh, revenue from uh, from Facebook with 89 percent. Wow, that's 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 a great case study, actually. And congrats on, on such results. Uh, so thank you, Petra, for uh, chiming in on, on how this can actually benefit uh, marketers and CMOs. Uh, and I also want to remind the audience that in a bit, I just have one last slide to cover. We're going to go into Q&A. And you can actually ask the questions in general, but you can also direct them to Brian, myself, or also to Petra, if you would be interested. Uh, and she would be, she's actually so kind to stay in a couple more minutes. And if there's any questions, you can also tackle them. So now the final slide, I think we, sh we cannot end any differently than with a recommendation uh, for you who are watching this. And that is when is it okay to use Google Analytics for and when not? So I think it's completely okay to use it if you're predominantly using Google channels, as Brian was joking about, and, and Google ad stack. So in, in such a scenario, 
Are you completely fine? And, and it's probably a good idea, a very good idea to just use GA4 and you're completely fine. Now, when I would definitely not recommend relying on GA4 attribution is when significant portion of your media budget goes to non-Google channels, or more specifically, wall gardens or other digital upper funnel channels and activities. Um, that is not to say you cannot use GA4 for other use cases, um, for other you know analytical reports, etc. But definitely for attribution, that is not a way to go. And actually, if you're trusting those numbers, which you know we established are quite wrong, it can actually read lead you to a media mix that is actually underperforming. And, and that can, you know, uh, lead into a revenue loss. So definitely on this front, this is not recommended. And, and you know, the advice is to seek uh, for something uh, more advanced that can also work uh, with these impressions and wall gardens. All right. Uh, so that's all we've got. Uh, I think we can now go into Q and A. If you know, we're trying to answer as many questions as possible in, in the following five to 10 minutes. Uh, but if, if you still have some other questions, you can also get in touch with us using this URL, or you can just use this QR code. You can scan it uh, with, your, with your phone and you can sort of fill out the form and, and, and we can sort of discuss more about what are your struggles with GA4 are and maybe how we can overcome those. But now I'm, I'm giving it to Brian who uh, who will sort of moderate the Q&A session. Sure. Uh, so, Pavel, can you see the questions? Can you see the posts yet that I've approved? Yes. Okay. I can see them, yeah. Um, so, first question from Matt uh, says, we are, we are using company reporting by each of the platforms, and we watch the total cost of sales, so we did not even need GA, um, and he's asking about how platforms like ours, like would they be applicable? Um, right. Yeah, so that's a good question. We, we already a little bit tackled that when we were talking about how are these platforms actually reporting uh, the conversions that they take 100% credit for everything they remotely touched. The problem with this is if you're using, for instance, free platforms, let's say Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, as an example, uh, all of them sort of are going to report everything they've touched, but there is obviously an overlap, right? So uh, you're going to end up with more reported conversions than actually happened. And that is a huge issue uh, because you're then double counting, triple counting, <laughs> quadruple counting conversions. And, and you then cannot just carry it with the sales results. And so in this case, definitely, uh, we would recommend establishing either GA or some other measurement uh, that is going to sort of justify that can see through the overlaps and decide, you know, in case of an overlap, who, who should deserve what and, and, and what kind of percentage. Yeah, I mean, you know, everyone's situation is a bit different. So obviously we'd have to, you know, speak with you specifically, but, you know, we have seen situations in the past where, um, you know, there's, there's overlapping credit, like the same dollar of revenue ends up being credited to multiple platforms. So that's, that's just a watch out. Right. Um, so, I mean, hopefully that's a helpful answer, but, uh, you know, we'll reach out to everybody that posted a question afterwards in case you want to talk further. Um, so the second question is about brick and mortar versus online purchases. Um, you know, maybe I'll take the first stab at this since, you know, my career started, started off analyzing primarily brick and mortar sales, you know, yes, uh, probably the intuition behind this question is that, is that most of this is designed for a website based KPI. Um, however, you know, we have seen some creative applications here where there there might be an interim KPI like a coupon download or a store finder, you know, traffic to a store finder page. So sometimes there are still applications that are helpful. The other thing to think about is that, you know, these like attribution systems, are, they are more than just 
uh, estimating the influence of conversion. They're also incredibly helpful to organize data. So there are applications for brick and mortar businesses where attribution platforms like ours are still helpful to give real time access directly to source data and organize it and get it ready for other use. Um, yeah, maybe I would just add a little bit on top of that. Yeah, obviously for brick and mortar use case, you know, we can measure the soft KPIs, sort of as Brian was saying, and and indeed this you know MTA approach is more suitable for e-tailers, obviously. However, you know, even if if you're a brick and mortar and and you want to use, uh, you want to measure your sort of media efficiency, uh, maybe you can apply a different method, which is mixed marketing modeling. Uh, but then you know if you're using maybe both brick and mortar and also e-com sales. Uh, then you can apply these two different methodologies, and, and at the end, it's it's a, it's an advantage if you can have both of these from uh, let's say the same uh, company, the same sort of the same vendor. Uh, so that's also where uh, where we can come in handy because we can provide both the MMM uh, and the MTA methodology for this. Yeah. Um, so just skipping around here, there's a question. Uh, can I see how revenue AI works, or is it a black box? All right, that's that's a good I one. I know the answer, but I'll let you take it. <laughs> it's a good one. So I think we've always pride ourselves um, on uh, being transparent and open. Um, and so obviously, you know, we cannot show fully our IP and, and the source code and all that. Uh, what I think we our clients would testify to the fact that. Uh, we always really explain how the model works, what parameters are going in, what where are going out. We also believe that all the data that goes in should be fully exportable and, and should go out. And we even provide something that's called a, a, a raw path export, where uh, you can actually see every individual click and every individual impression. And you can see into which paths we put it, how much credit did we give it? And, and so it's highly auditable. So if, for instance, if you have a data scientist on, in your team who's, who's sort of versed with these attribution models, we can give him this underlying data set and he can run maybe a parallel uh, model uh, that he built himself, you know? And then you can see whether these models are outputting similar results. So uh, I think we want to be as far from a black box as is possible uh, without actually revealing the IP. Yeah, I got you. All right, so we're getting a little short on time, but I, I thought this was an interesting question that just came through from from Alex. Um, you know, the, he's pointing out that there are there can still be discrepancies in conversions between GA four and Google Ads, and is asking. Um, you know, whether a platform like Revenue could run independently of Google, so it's not biased by Google? Yeah, um, so there, yeah, so it's also a good question, and there are two, two ways to answer this. So first is yes, you're completely right. Uh, funnily enough, results in GA4 and results in G ads are different, and that is a completely separate topic that we were not able to cram into today's presentation, uh, but yes, it is, a, it is a big issue. So there are two things you can do with this. First is uh, we are also providing a Chrome plugin that allows you to export Google attributed results, sorry, revenues attributed results directly back to uh, G ads. So you can see more columns in your reports and those columns would, would be with our attributed data. So that's one way to go about this. The second way is you can actually, you know, for attribution purposes, and again, we, we could not fit that in, in today's presentation, you can completely ditch Google measurement and you can replace it with your attribution vendor measurement. So we can implement our own uh, tracking pixel on your website and then be completely independent on what Google is doing, how they're suppressing direct visits and all of these other stuff. Uh, we can just track it directly ourselves and provide an unbiased, even more unbiased view on what's happening. So I think we have time for maybe one more, Brian, right? 
Um, yeah, so probably a fairly quick one, question from Peter uh, saying, are we able to attribute based on geographical data? Yeah, uh, so that really depends. But like, I, I mean, markets also, I mean, countries for sure. Uh, and, and, then, uh, and, and then in the US and in the UK, for example, and there are also these geo regions uh, that either follow just the state borders or, or are even more granular. I think there's 180 in, in the US and I think there's 14 in the UK. Uh, so we can also break the, the results down uh, following these uh, sort of agreed upon uh, geo boundaries uh, that are shared, uh, hopefully with all the, all the ad providers and vendors. Yeah, I mean, and for that, we, we're often also connecting to CRM so that we're getting the location associated with the, the conversion in your yep. official CRM system. So yeah, that's that's definitely fairly straightforward. And, and yes, often important in the US to be at the DMA or city level. Um, Okay, so I know we didn't get to quite all of the questions and we really do appreciate that we, we clearly, we should have saved a bit more time for Q&A. Uh, this was a great audience, um, but we will get back to every single question directly and we're, we're happy to talk more on this, but you know, I guess webinar etiquette, we absolutely can't go over and we've got less than a minute left. Um, so I really wanna thank uh, our speakers and, and our audience for joining and uh, making this at least what I thought was a great session. Uh, yeah, and, and thank you guys uh, for being here. Thank you for all the questions. We'll come back to you and hopefully uh, we'll, each, we'll see each other soon on next webinar or a, in the real life scenario. So have a, have a good evening or, <laughs> or day depending uh, uh, where you are currently. All right. Thanks.